Jeffrey Smith, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. I am excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. You've been you've been thinking about uh, genetic modification, genetic engineering for a long time, and um, so have I. And I have been very confused. There are days in which um, I'm not sure what side I'm on. There are days in which I don't know how to evaluate the science, and so I'm look I'm looking forward to getting getting your take. Maybe start by talking about like how your journey a little bit, like how this became something that you first got interested in, concerned about, and ultimately have devoted a lot of your life to. Sure. 25 years ago, I got involved. I went to a lecture by a genetic engineer in 1996, actually about 26 years ago. Um, and he was blowing the whistle on the technology. He was an award-winning, um, rather prominent uh, genius scientist. And it was the year that uh, Monsanto's Roundup Ready soy and corn were going to be harvested and put into the food supply. And he was saying there is no way that anyone on this planet could guarantee the safety of this technology because it is prone to side effects. No matter what, uh, how well-intentioned you are, no matter what good trait you have in the gene that you're going to be putting into the soybeans, in this case, it was to allow the soy plants to be sprayed with Roundup. So it was Roundup ready soybeans. So Monsanto sold the seeds and Monsanto sold the Roundup. So they get a double hit. Uh, and there's problems with that because you end up eating the Roundup residues, which is quite dangerous. But even if it were beneficent in terms of the trait, bringing in more vitamins or whatever, the technology was prone to side effects, creating massive collateral damage in the DNA with results that we were unable to predict. So we couldn't stop the collateral damage. We couldn't predict the outcome of the collateral damage. It would be impacting anyone who eats the product potentially. And once you release the GMOs outdoors, it could spread to other non-GMO plants through cross-pollination, forever contaminating the gene pool. So it was changing the nature of nature in a way that had never been available before to humanity. It was being rushed to market based on a company that was, everyone knows now about Monsanto's dark past. They, they ignore uh, serious health problems and cover them up. And we've caught them red-handed doing that with GMOs and Roundup since. And that we also knew at the time that they had co-opted the approval process for GMOs, where the actual FDA policy was created by their former attorney, Michael Taylor, who claimed that GMOs had no significant difference from non-GMOs, and therefore no safety testing was necessary, no labeling was necessary. In fact, Monsanto can introduce GMOs without even telling the FDA. Seven years later, we discovered that it was all a fraud, that the most that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA was exactly the opposite, and they were ignored and denied by Monsanto's former attorney, who then became Monsanto's vice president, who then became the U.S. food czar under the Obama administration, back and forth, revolving door. So <clears throat> to answer your question, I heard about this and realized this needs to have some attention. So I decided to help out a little, and two books and five films and a 1,000 lectures in 45 countries later, I've been involved in the issue. Mm. What, what, was it something specific about this one? I mean, you, you know, from your background, you seem like someone who's been sort of keeping your ear to the ground of like environmental challenges, social challenges, political challenges. What was it about GMOs that made you say this is the one? Well, it's interesting that um, a few years ago, I met someone who had spoken with an indigenous elder from Hawaii who had predicted to him in the early 90s that there was a risk to the planet that we would end biological evolution as we know it. And when he used those words, I realized I know of nothing that fits that bill better than genetic engineering, and in particular, the gene editing, the new forms of genetic engineering that are also prone to side effects, but they're so cheap and easy, you can do it in your basement and a do-it-yourself kit with Amazon. And I realized back then, 26 years ago, that 
this was this was an A level priority. That once you release, it's irreversible. If you change the nature of nature and you put it out there, you have basically sentenced the ecosystems of all future generations. You've sentenced the food supply, uh, at least of some generations. I mean, you could even if you stopped producing genetically engineered seeds, you'd still contaminate the soy and corn genome forever, the gene pool. And it was um, a, a mix that was fundamentally disastrous or disaster prone uh, because you're dealing with the most compactified, intelligent source of, of biology that gets passed on from generation to generation. And you're tinkering it with very narrow understanding rushing it long before the science was ready for the purpose of making money and ignoring the results of science and not even doing the basic science. I remember reading memos made public from a lawsuit in 1999 of a microbiologist at the FDA who predicted that with this unscientific policy put forward by Monsanto's former attorney, that there would be a sense over time that it's been done a thousand times and it must be safe and that the companies wouldn't even be doing the research that they would normally do because it's not on the list of, a, of required mm -hmm. research. And that's exactly what happened. The predictions turned out to be true. And right now, if you look at the epidemiological evidence from about 30 major diseases, they rise in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup. Now, that's correlational. I'm always acknowledging that correlation doesn't mean causation. Even though it's a very tight correlation, autism, uh, diabetes, weight problems, gastrointestinal problems, cancer. But when you have that as one set of data, and then you add, we, we did a survey of 3,256 people who got better from 28 different conditions when they switched to non-GMO and largely organic foods, it fits right with those epidemiological evidence. When you look at the animal feeding studies, those animals suffer from those diseases or their precursors. And then <clears throat> when you take animals or humans like pets and livestock, for example, switch them to a non-GMO diet, they get better from those sets of diseases. And when you look at the modes of action that we now have identified for GMOs and Roundup, how it damages the mitochondria, the microbiome creates leaky gut, damages the neurotransmitter production, hormonal structure, uh, inter intercellular communications, digestive capacities, uh, ability to absorb minerals, all of these things which are fundamental to health, you can draw a line between the modes of action and the particular disease. Something as innocuous perhaps as insomnia, not innocuous for those that have it. How come insomnia might be related to this? Well, Roundup blocks the shikimate pathway, which is used by the gut bacteria to produce L-tryptophan, which is the precursor to serotonin, which is the precursor to melatonin, which governs our sleep. If you block that, you may block production of melatonin and cause sleep disorders, which have risen in parallel. You can do the same thing with autism and diabetes and, and leukemia and irritable bowel, etc., tracking these causative effects. But right now we have so much data that I've been able to present it to medical conferences, convincing tens of thousands of doctors and other healthcare practitioners to prescribe organic diets. And what they tell me is that it works, that the people actually get better. I remember talking to Michelle Perro, who's in a few of my films, pediatrician. She saw a wave of diseases coming up in her, in her uh, patient population after GMOs and Roundup were introduced and didn't realize what it was she happened to read one of my books, thought it might be the GMOs and Roundup, started taking the families that were presenting to her onto organic diets, and then she could treat them like she used to. So mm. we have a lot of data right now and a lot of confidence in our results. Okay. So I first started hearing about this uh, from an agricultural perspective when I was doing a permaculture design course. And mm -hmm. hear that, that Monsanto, um, the Roundup Ready crops and some others, were actually um, sort of out of the bag. And in fact, there were, there were farmers who were using it against their will who were being sued by Monsanto for not paying royalties on the crops that had blown into their fields. Is that, am I getting that right? Yes, basically 
the way the reason why GMOs were rushed to market long before the science could justify it, and it still can't justify GMOs in our food supplier environment because there's still massive, unpredictable collateral damage. They wanted to maintain a domination in the herbicide market. They had a patent on glyphosate. Glyphosate is the chief poison in Roundup. It's not the only poison, but they call it the only active ingredient. There's things in there that are even more dangerous. But it was going off of patent in year 2000. So they created Roundup-ready crops to sell to farmers. Right now we have Roundup-ready soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, and alfalfa. All are used in the food supply. All are used in animal feed. And when a farmer buys the Roundup-ready seeds, which they want to because it makes weeding so easy, you can spray right over the top of the field, killing all of the other plant biodiversity and leaving the Roundup-ready crops intact. If they were not Roundup-ready, they would die. So it makes weeding very easy, but they can't use it unless they sign an agreement form. And the agreement form requires that when they buy and apply the glyphosate-based herbicides, it's not the Chinese generic versions, it's Monsanto's Roundup or one of the names that they market their glyphosate-based herbicides from. So that has kept them lively in the Roundup market. Um, and what happens is in order to enforce the behavior of farmers, they would send out Pinkerton, hired Pinkerton uh, security people, former Royal Canadian, Canadian Mounted Police in Canada, and they would go into these trespass into the farms that they thought may be using their seeds and take samples and have it tested. And they would send out threatening letters saying, we believe that you've stolen our seeds and you need to pay us $170,000. And if you do, we may not sue you. Mm. And they sent hundreds of these out. And there was a report done years ago where some of these farmers would be, describe the fields that Monsanto said were theirs and weren't even, weren't even their field. Mm. Or they had never planted Roundup Ready uh, corn or soy or – but – because of the cross-pollination or even the seed contamination. The most famous is Percy Schmeiser, who had canola growing, never bought Monsanto's canola seeds, and got sued by Monsanto because some seeds blew over from passing trucks and from nearby fields, and, they, and Monsanto won at the local appeals court and Supreme Court of Canada, which concluded it didn't matter that he didn't intentionally buy or use Monsanto seeds. It didn't matter because as long as it transferred onto his property by insects or wind, and he then replanted his seeds, which he had done for 50 years, that violated intellectual property law. And the court said, you know, we can't change the law, but that's how the law is. Maybe the law needs to be changed, and it hasn't. Mm -hmm. So it basically forces some farmers to buy Monsanto seeds so they don't get sued. And now, because Roundup is losing its efficacy among weeds, they've now created Roundup-ready crops that are also resistant to dicamba, which is another herbicide. So Monsanto and others mix Roundup and dicamba together, but dicamba volatilizes. It floats in the air. It travels up to miles away and has caused millions of dollars in damages. Uh, 30,000 complaints or something like that from the EPA, just tremendous numbers. And that's being reviewed now. And a lot of the farmers say we can't afford to buy non-GMO seeds because we're going to get damage from dicamba. So we need to buy dicamba resistant GMOs. And in, during the last trial, evidence was shown from Monsanto that they planned for that, that kind of biological extortion where it was, they knew they were going to force farmers to use dicamba resistant seeds because otherwise the the floating vapor from of dicamba from neighboring seeds would damage mm. or destroy their neighbors. Mm. So you you mentioned that the, the, uh, the all the courts found for Monsanto because of intellectual property laws. There's there's something I find deeply offensive about an organism being intellectual property. It feels like it's a 
a road back to some forms of slavery that, you know, if we're, if we're, if the, the march of human history is towards more and more freedom and dignity for the individual, it seems like this is going in the other direction. Yeah, the Supreme Court had two cases regarding the genetic engineering of organisms. The second one, Clarence Thomas, who almost never writes the majority of the opinion, wrote it. And he was a former Monsanto attorney and never recused himself. Uh, and it was the it was in favor of Monsanto. Yeah, there's been a um, an uprising that was muzzled now originally when uh, there was a bid to try and genetic uh, to patent all these life forms. Um, and some countries have a resistance, but essentially there's been a unbelievably coordinated campaign by Monsanto to lock the world into an intellectual property framework through international treaties. And they're so influential when other countries asked the U.S. to help them establish intellectual property law. And this is absolutely true. They said, OK, great. Talk to these people. They'll help you, help you do it. Those people was Monsanto. Hmm. So Monsanto basically dictated the intellectual property uh, laws and regulations that are now laid there. And the World Trade Organization has adopted them, et cetera. Um, it, is, it is a problem. It's not the fight that I'm fighting because that takes a legal team and you could spend millions of dollars and lose with no incremental gains. What I did for 25 years is educate consumers about the health dangers. It's linked to all these different diseases. I had to show that the FDA and Monsanto's credibility were completely shot. And that was easy to do because <laughs> we showed how they had rigged research and corrupt approvals. And then I had to give people a way that they could choose non-GMO so we could create the economic impact forcing companies to go non-GMO so that they didn't lose market share to the same product on the shelf that had a non-GMO label. So that was my focus, to focus on the health dangers and the corrupt approvals and whatnot. And we've been very successful. 51% of U.S. consumers believe GMOs are unsafe, 48% around the world. And we just pivoted last year to focus on the new GMO technology and to specifically protect the microbiome, the human microbiome, the soil microbiome, the earth's microbiome, the microorganisms from the dangers of introducing genetically engineered microbes, because that turns out to be an existential threat that is at the highest level of concern. If anyone watches the film, don't let the gene out of the bottle, 16 minutes available at protectnaturenow.com. In those 16 minutes, you realize, OMG, there is an existential threat that has been released now on the planet where if we do nothing, if we have no new laws, we will potentially, as had been predicted, alter and change, end biological evolution as we know it, maybe wipe out species, collapse ecosystems, have permanent damage to human health, create also new pandemics. All of that from genetically engineered microbes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So I wanted to ask about that, the sort of the, the spillover. So we know that there's, you know, the, the, the GM, the Roundup Ready soy can uh, outcompete regular soy. So before we get into the microbes, can is, is there any evidence that there can be gene transmission across species? So, that, you know, one day we wake up and we've got Roundup Ready weeds. We've got, you know, Roundup Ready crabgrass and Bermuda. Like my wife and I spend most of our free time battling Bermuda grass. Like if someone gave her a bottle and said, this will get this will take care of it. And we believe that it wouldn't you know harm our garden. We would buy it by the truckload. Right. Yeah, are, yeah, there, yeah. Are, there, are there dangers? Well, you're absolutely... or... yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Howie, you're, you're right on. I mean, the the amount of herbicide tolerant weeds, it's. I think it's over 300 million acres around the world. It's on 50% of the agricultural land as of two years ago. Um, there's a selection pressure that happens like with antibiotics. There is gene transfer as well. There's evidence been peer reviewed published studies. Um, and <clears throat> it's interesting that it's like the weeds have outsmarted Monsanto and we're doing all our, our education and whatnot. In the meantime, the, the weeds are also winning in the field. So, 
just using Roundup these days isn't good enough. And so they've doubled up on the herbicide tolerance. I've mentioned dicamba and Roundup. Since dicamba is a problem, they're focusing more on the 2,4-D and Roundup combination. The 2,4-D is a product, is a component of Agent Orange linked to cancer. And so what happened when they introduced Roundup-ready herbicide-tolerant crops, the amount of herbicide in the United States went up by about half a million pounds um, in six, the first 16 years and a lot more since uh, because the they need to apply more and more and more to kill these resistant weeds. And now they're com- creating new cocktails. Mm. So now let's let's uh, let's talk about the microbes. So I was watching a, a panel discussion with uh, you, with you and Elaine Ingham. Um, can you share her 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 story? Is like one of the like if it were a horror movie, if it were like a, an end of the world disaster movie, it wouldn't seem credible. I agree. Uh, and she is featured on this 60 minute film. Don't let the gene out of the bottle. We also did a live stream at the National Press Club and had a webinar as well with a couple of other experts. So Elaine Ingham was a professor at Oregon State University, and she was an advisor to a a student that wanted to get his PhD and wanted to do some research on genetically engineered organisms. And there just so happened to be a group that was very well-meaning that created genetically engineered bacteria from a natural occurring soil microbe. So they, they, as Elaine explained to me, there'd been a lot of problems in creating microbes that would survive in the soil. So they took one from the soil and rejiggered it so that it would turn plant matter into alcohol. It would break down cellulose and turn it into alcohol. So the plan was for them to distribute this bacteria to farmers so that the farmers would not have to burn their crop residues. Instead, they would put it into a big barrel with the bacteria, and then in two weeks or so, open the spigot at the bottom, and there'd be uh, alcohol available to run their tractors, available to sell off farm, And on top of that, there'd be sludge at the bottom of the barrel, which could be used to spread onto fields as fertilizer. So in other words, like a a microwave um, biodigester, like the people have been using around the world for thousands of years. Right. So it was, it was, it was, it was, it it was going to be a great idea and it was just going to make it more efficient. So farmers with larger operations could take advantage of it. Yes, precisely. Uh, What could go wrong? They were going to. (laughs) This is where it gets interesting. Good question, Howie. Well, the scientist, the PhD candidate, was able to obtain some microbes from the company and mixed it with soil and grew wheat seeds compared to a couple of control groups and came into his lab one Saturday morning early and was shocked to find all these plants that had died. He told me that, or Elaine told me that she got a call from him an early Saturday morning. He was frantic, wondering if he had done something wrong and all this and all this. She said, just sep- just separate out what was killed and what was not and figure it out. And he did. And it turned out all of those um, planters that had the genetically engineered microbes added to the soil had died and the plant had turned to slime. He discovered that the bacterium was turning those plants into alcohol, killing them, destroying the roots and destroying everything else. And this was discovered two weeks before the scientists were going to release this outdoors to see how far it could travel. Now, Elaine Ingham was aware that roots in terrestrial systems die in the presence of alcohol and that all of the roots everywhere on earth had this particular bacterium populated its rhizosphere. It was Klebsiella planticola for those that are interested. And that 
it was Klebsiella planticula could normally die in the presence of alcohol, but not the genetically engineered version. So there was the risk that the GMO version could out survive the natural version and take over that niche. So how far would the bacteria have spread? Well, we didn't need a pandemic to know that microbes can travel around the world. In fact, whistleblowers at the Environmental Protection Agency contacted Dr. Ingham and said that they had done a secret study where they released a nitrogen-fixing bacterium in Louisiana and then monitored the movement and found that every year it got wider and wider, miles and miles, and eventually it was found everywhere on the planet. So I asked Dr. Ingham, I said, what's the, what's the result? What would have happened potentially if they had released this bacterium two weeks later as planned? And she said the logical consequence is that we would end terrestrial plant life on the planet. If it spread, if it dominated, if it, all, all these ifs, but all those ifs were plausible scientifically. And fortunately, we didn't have to figure out if it was if all those ifs were true, because when they discovered that it killed the plants, the scientists wisely bottled it, bottled it up or destroyed it, and it was never released. In the same film, we have another bacterium that, if it had been released as planned, could have potentially changed weather patterns on the planet, because this bacteria normally condenses water vapor into drops and creates um, frost and snow. And they had disabled that capacity to prevent frost on strawberries and potatoes if that had become the dominant species in the atmosphere instead of its natural counterpart, it could have been a disaster. So you could see these are two microbes, Howie, where if they simply did what they were planning to do but did it too well, could have been a ecosystem disaster. Now we know everyone's aware of the mutations and the varieties of microbes, microbes mutate and they travel to ecosystems that were never intended, but they also swap genes. So the alcohol producing gene might end up in a thousand other microbes. The gene that, 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 you know, all these different changes, even the collateral damaged genes that occur as a result of the process of gene editing and other methods of genetic engineering could transfer to other microbes changing the nature of nature. The microbiome turns out to be life critical and mission critical for humans and the environment. According to world expert Kieran Krishnan, 80% of human chronic diseases can find their source in changes in the human microbiome. And now we're talking about a gene editing technique that you can do soon in every high school biology class, in every college biology class, in your homegrown laboratory. So if we don't stop it within a generation, we might release a million of these that can mutate, swap genes, travel, and change the structure of the microbiome. We've just looked at two of them that could have catastrophic, catastrophic effects. What if we have a million? Hmm. So what's coming to me from this story is a bunch of things that are sort of principles that I'm I'm hearing, but one of them is that a lot of the impetus behind this work is really well-meaning, right? It's not like everyone at Monsanto or everyone who's doing this is like, you know, an evil genius wanting to enslave the world and become rich and make us everyone else miserable. You know, so in, in the plant-based community, we have, as you know, the Impossible Burger, which a lot of people are thrilled about because they see it as a pathway for, for meat eaters to move to a more plant-based diet, whether that's for health or environmental reasons or, or ethical reasons. Um, I'm sure there's people, there's scientists out there who are looking at climate change and saying, we need a way to have a more stable food supply for humans. So let's, let's engineer microbes to produce corn and wheat and we don't need fields anymore. We can do it all in, in laboratories. Um, and there's a certain there's a certain self righteousness that comes with believing you're doing the right thing, that I think can can uh, make people quite 
uh, blind to the, the potential negative consequences. How, how do you how do you think about that? Well, let's talk about the Impossible Burger very specifically, because I'm sure there's some people listening who want to know whether the stuff in their refrigerator is safe or not. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say right at the beginning, I have a, a, a sort of a statement that friends don't let friends eat the Impossible Burger. And I'll explain why. Um, there's something called synthetic biology, where you take a gene and you put it into a microbe, turning that microbe into a factory. So the, it was done in the 1980s by a Japanese company, Showa Denko KK. They were a company, a chemical company, and they were one of their products was L-tryptophan, an essential amino acid, which is supposedly good for stress and for sleeping etc. It's a precursor to serotonin. We all know about serotonin as a happy chemical. So this was a pill or other formulations of L-tryptophan produced in Japan. But starting in 1984, one of the early commercial applications of genetic engineering, they started putting genes into the bacteria that they had in their fermentation vats so that the product of those vats would have more of the final result so they didn't have to do a subsequent processing. And every year or two, they'd add another gene and they didn't realize it, but as they added new genes, different contaminants, very small amounts, 0.1%, 0.01% ended up in the L-tryptophan. And when it came to the United States where it was sold, it still passed the pharmaceutical standard of being at least 98.5% pure but it was deadly. It killed about 100 Americans, and it caused a disease that was absolutely horrific. Pa paralysis, pain that, that, that the doctors had never seen in their practices, and five to 10,000 fell sick, many of them permanently disabled. And it was almost missed. It took a coincidence of doctors that had multiple patients with the same symptoms and they were able to find out that they were taking tryptophan. And then it was stopped. Now, this was a process of genetic engineering in a closed VAT system where there was some side effect that was un unknown about that caused these contaminants. Now, in the Impossible Burger, they use a similar technique with yeast. And there was a study done on yeast where they took yeast genes and just doubled them up in the yeast and found that there was a carcinogen that increased, I think, by 60 to 200 percent or 200 fold. And they were shocked and they warned and saying, be careful when you genetically engineer yeast, because this is something we never would have predicted. We don't know why it's the case, but be careful. So in comes the Impossible Burger, wanting to create a burger that looks like meat. So first of all, they use Roundup Ready soybeans sprayed with Roundup. We can talk more about what Roundup does. Just for that, I would disqualify it as food and call it a food-shaped object to be avoided. Hmm. But in order to get the red heme, they took a protein from soy roots. They took a gene that produced the, the roots and put it into yeast. And it had never been part of the human food supply. But they decided, let's just check with the FDA for, to, to give it generally recognized as safe status. Because the FDA, up until that point, allowed all companies to determine on their own if their GMOs were gen generally recognized as safe, because that was the Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former att attorney policy. In an unbelievable move, the FDA said, no, there's no evidence that you're presenting that this is safe. It has not been part of the human food supply. And besides that, you didn't purify the protein after the fermentation vat. It's only about 70%. In the slurry, there's 30% of other uncharacterized proteins. In fact, 46 of them, we have no idea if they're healthy. And you've just put it into the burger. And we have the experience, they're not saying this, but we have the experience of the same synthetic biology killing people. And so they said, no, it's not generally, generally recognized as safe. And Impossible Burger said, thank you very much. 
We don't care. We're going to market it anyway. They didn't need to have it as generally recognized as safe. And then later during the Trump administration, that was reversed. No new data came to support its efficacy and safety, but it was changed to, oh, now it's considered generally recognized as safe. So now when people eat this, they're eating Roundup. They're eating Roundup Ready Soy, which we can trace Roundup and Roundup Ready Soy to problems in the testicles, in the liver, in the kidneys, changes in the heart, uh, to potentially uh, all sorts of things. Um, Basically, you name it in terms of system problems. And it has these uncharacterized proteins, and it has this new protein in large amounts. Now, we've heard, I was speaking to someone yesterday, who had eaten the Impossible Burger and felt ill afterwards. There are hundreds or thousands of people, but that shouldn't be the criteria because you shouldn't have to feel ill to figure out if something is a problem. We know that a lot of people do feel ill afterwards, but I don't rely on that. I say this is a food-shaped object that should be avoided. There's a Beyond Burger that's non-GMO. There's other plant-based burgers for those that want to be vegan or vegetarian that don't put us at risk. And because no one is doing the, the feeding studies, there was a rat study that was done for, I think, just 28 days, and there was substantial changes in the markers in these rats that could have that should have raised red flags independent analysis by experts say these are problems that were ignored by the impossible burger company so what they did find out was covered up or ignored what they didn't look at was even bigger and now it's it's available in the food supply no one in washington is protecting because of the waving it onto the market the decision to avoid the Impossible Burger is not just personally important for one's health. It also contributes to protecting our food supply. It's a very well-funded company. Gates' money is behind it. He's a big pro-GMO person. And it's got a valuation of almost a billion dollars. And it's still not making money, but if it succeeds... It means that many other foods will be replaced. Uh, and one of the examples are the concept, the myth of active ingredient, um, where they want to isolate and create through synthetic biology the medicinal property of ashwagandha and other Ayurvedic herbs, of, of other medicinal herbs that are in in the natural system in the United States, of flavorings, et cetera. They already have synthetic biology vanilla. They want to do CBD, et cetera. So what happens is there's a number of things that, that, that occurs. First of all, if you just do the active, so-called active ingredient, it's like I said before, Roundup has tons of different chemicals in it, and they call glyphosate the active ingredient, but it's but the Roundup itself is 125 times more dangerous than glyphosate alone. When you have the full compounds interacting from plants, they actually have evolved together and have an influence on human health that we haven't yet evaluated. Their RNA as a as a contributor to our health, their phytochemicals, etc. So we can eliminate those by going to synthetic biology. We have the potential side effects that we saw in L-tryptophan and these extra proteins that we saw in the Impossible Burger. It can wipe out ecosystems that have developed for centuries to produce the natural version. So by replacing the vanilla, by replacing saffron, the, the people in the countries that have been developing that industry can lose their livelihood. The In order to use synthetic biology, you have to feed the fermentation vat. Typically, you feed it with corn. So you have instead of having the natural plantations of these plants, you now have more genetically engineered corn with its economic damages and environmental damages that feed this. And finally, you're creating these genetically engineered yeasts and bacteria. And what if they escape? What if they're not completely destroyed when they're released? Now... We are contaminating the environment with genetically engineered microbes, and we're back where we were before. So 
If you have a sin bio situation with algae, let's say not even food, just to create biofuels, great idea. Let's turn algae into, into gasoline factories or alcohol factories. And it gets little pieces, tiny powdered algae blows into the ocean. Well, algae is responsible to, for 50 to 80% of the oxygen on the planet. What happens if there's an oops moment? So here's where stepping up to being a responsible citizen at this time of this technology and protecting oneself would dictate not eating or buying the Impossible Burger. And as I said, friends don't let friends eat the Impossible Burger. Mm. So I'm just going to take a moment to uh, to talk directly to my listeners to, to explain why I don't have sponsors for this podcast. Because if I had sponsors for this podcast, <laughs> Impossible Burger would be up there in terms of getting people to eat more plants, and I would have to can this conversation. So, uh, um, you know, it, at some point we all have to follow the money to see, right, who who can be trusted in terms of what, you know, what the, what the model is. Um, so years ago, I contributed to a book um, called Whole, with, written by Dr. T. Colin Campbell, which was basically about nutrition. And his big point after being kind of you know, a nutritional biochemist for 50 years was that this stuff is way more complex than we will ever understand. And we should be very cautious about messing around with it. And at the same time, you know, human beings and especially scientists and creative people, we have this urge to like just break shit and to see what happens and try new things. How do how do we reconcile the urge for progress, uh, well-meaning progress, with the the sort of you know neat, late stage capitalist logic of of you know of profitability over everything else and this this sort of pathological urge to control nature how do how do we how do we stay human with all these things out of the bag or close i love the question howie very rich so let's mm -hmm. dive into that i do not resent scientists for tinkering it's what they do their curiosity their interest they're driven by that and within that world, there are certain boundaries. <clears throat> so I remember uh, in a few years ago, 2012, there was an announcement that two different labs created an airborne version of H5N1 avian flu. Now that has a, had a 52% kill rate, but it was very hard to contract. You had to be hanging around a lot of birds. So in in a decade, only less than a thousand people had ever gotten the AV H5N1 avian flu, but more than half died. So what these two labs did is create an airborne version, which was such a shock to the scientific world that the Obama administration put in a partial ban of this Gain of function research on potentially pandemic pathogens. There'd been over a thousand reported escapes and accidents from high profile, high security laboratories. And if this had escaped, it could have been decimating the human population. So a, a line in the sand, so to speak, had been created. It wasn't a line, you know, on steel because there was, you know, funding of, of gain of function elsewhere, but and then it was reversed again in 2017. But within, there was a, for a while, and there was a sense of, okay, we have to operate in the lanes. Now, an easier understanding is everyone knows we don't give a detonator to a atomic bomb to a teenager and say, don't press the red button. Everyone, it's completely logical. But we haven't yet, as a civilization, stepped up to an understanding that we are in a place where we can easily and irreversibly redirect the streams of evolution of all time in ways that are unpredictable with current science. Therefore, you don't give a gene editing kit to anyone 
who will release a new organism into the environment that could end up changing the nature of nature. The logic of the atom bomb is in society. We've seen the damage. We understand what a large explosion is. When we think about what a biological uh, damage or collapse of an ecosystem, we can think of releasing 24 rabbits on Christmas Eve, a Christmas Day in 1859 in Australia that by the 1920s grew up to over 10 billion rabbits because it didn't have a natural predator in Australia and it destroyed or changed the ecosystem forever. We are in a situation where with gene editing, we can introduce new invasive species that look like the old ones. We can replace all of the elements in an ecosystem. And let's just focus about the microbes. We can release all sorts of microbes where the other microbiome says, oh, look, you look very familiar. Let's incorporate you in this same pathway that we've been doing, that we co-evolved. Co-evolved with humans. The microbiome inside us is so intelligent, we have outsourced 90% of our daily functions to it. We can get by with 22,000 genes less than earthworms because we use the 3.5 million genes in our microbiome. In the second trimester, milk digesting bacteria moves into the birth canal. So it inoculates, inoculates the child so that they can digest the milk. It, and not only that, but most of the, a lot of the milk is indigestible by the infant. It's not designed for the infant. It's designed to feed the microbiome. The health of the infant changes the microbiome and the saliva of the infant. It's fed back to the mother through the breast, and that changes the formula. And that's just in the beginning to establish a healthy microbiome, which sets up proper health for the rest of that person's life and future generations, potentially. It is, it is so important. It is fundamental and life critical. So if we can create those lanes in the minds of scientists and in the law, so yeah, you don't give a detonator to a teenager and you don't release genetically engineered microbes into the environment. We have two goals in our protectnaturenow.com campaign. No release of genetically engineered microbes, no gain of function enhancement of potentially pandemic pathogens, even inside high security bio labs because danger is too great. Those are the two goals. In order to make that happen, we need new laws, but laws change. I was flown to the to Poland by the Polish government, gave a press conference years ago with the Minister of Environment praising their non-GMO position. A week later, a pro-GMO government was voted into place. Similar stories in other parts of the world. It's not a stable solution to just rely on laws and, and regimes because they change. So we need new laws and we need academic and popular culture support of this new understanding that we as a civilization have a new requirement given this new technology. Mm. So some of that, it really sound, seems like when I think about what I know about the human mind, it seems like an uphill battle because we're not very good at um, you know, blowback effect at unintended consequences. You know, I was listening today about on the radio about a um, a submarine that's going to go under the ice shelf in, 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 in Antarctica, looking for why. You know, and it says like if this thing if this thing melts, the ocean is going to rise by sixty five centimeters. And I'm like, well, that doesn't sound like much. Like, you know, it's a lot. Uh, but the, you know, just the way, like the way our minds work, we, we seem to have created a world that we really can't understand. Like if you said, you know, a comet is heading towards Earth. I don't know if you've seen the movie that just came out. Don't look up. I, I'm about to, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean this this whole conversation is basically that movie. <laughs> um, but like, how do we need different like? educational systems? Do we need different brains? Do we need a, uh, an overclass of elites who understand science and, uh, and probability? Because it, se it seems like these the types of dangers you're talking about, the human mind and brain were not evolved to respond to. I, oh, there's two really good ways I can go and I'm going to do, do both. You talked about a new education system. 
Uh, the, the U.S. education system was modeled after the Prussian system, which made good sh- soldiers. And uh, it was making good uh, workers and soldiers. And that involves, you know, following orders. And there's a, there's a tradition then of giving away power, giving away authority that is established and rooted in our educational systems. We give away power to parents, to schools, to experts, to government, etc. And so I would say one of the um, epidemics that allowed GMOs and many other problems to, to occur is the sense that it's someone else's responsibility and I'm sure they'll handle it. Hmm. And that's what happens with, I mean, when I travel to other countries, I say GMOs are dangerous. I'm talking to a regulator of a whole country that someone is in charge of evaluating GMOs. And they say, we don't have to evaluate it because your FDA has approved it. I then tell them that the FDA doesn't approve GMOs, that it was Monsanto's former attorney who was given FDA policy uh, and in charge of FDA policy when the White House instructed the FDA to promote GMOs. And his policy is that the company themselves determine whether the foods are safe and they don't have to do any safety studies. And then when you look at the Monsanto record, we've caught them red-handed rigging research for decades. I talked to a former Monsanto scientist. He said they saw that the genetically engineered corn damaged rats. And instead of withdrawing the corn, they rewrote the study to cover up the data. He told me that three of his colleagues who were studying and testing the milk from cows, from cows that were treated with Monsanto's genetically engineered bovine growth hormone, stopped drinking milk after that. One bought his own cow because it was so much cancer-promoting hormone in the milk. So you, it's like everyone says it's someone else's responsibility, and in the way it's set up, it becomes it's Monsanto's responsibility, and they've abdicated. So that's one thing. Yes, I do would like I would like to see a change in the way that we raise children and educate and society so there's not a giving away of power and authority, but rather an ownership and taking responsibility. And in this case, it's something that I encourage people to do. It's like, we're here in this human civilization right now where we can destroy it for all future generations. Let's make it our responsibility. Even if you can't do it full time like I do in all these countries, maybe you want to contribute. Maybe you want to go to our Protect Nature Now campaign site and hit go to the advocacy platform where in a single minute you can send a message to all of your elected officials, another minute to your local media and tweet it out, etc. There's ways that we can be involved even and take take responsibility and feel good with anything that we do. Now, that's one angle. The other angle is in order for us to be successful, Howie, we don't have time to build a movement from scratch. I've spent 25 years traveling in 45 countries building the movement to protect people from the health dangers of eating GMOs. But our choices in the supermarket are not going to stop GMO microbes. So we need actual laws. So I went to D.C. in October with Dr. Elaine Ingham and Dr. Tim LaSalle, both world experts in regenerative agriculture, because that's one field, one movement that relies on the microbes to do the heavy lifting. And we had tremendous interest on both sides of the aisle and both houses of Congress for the benefits of regenerative agriculture, which, according to these experts, could draw down 100% of all, all carbon emission levels every year. And if we also reduce carbon emissions at the same time, we can get to pre-industrial levels very quickly. And it increases farmer profit, outcomes, reduces the use of chemicals. It was a win-win-win. There's very much excitement. So why was I there? I'm not an expert in regenerative agriculture. I was there, as I said on the live stream in the National Press Club, water skiing behind these experts holding the insurance policy, saying, if you are going to invest in regenerative agriculture, you're investing in the microbiome to do the drawdown of carbon, to make the food more nutrient rich, to increase the, uh, the water absorbing capacities of the soil, et cetera, et cetera. You must protect the microbiome. So those that want to Solve climate change through that, they get to protect the microbiome. We can go back and talk about national security. 
Homeland Security, Department of Defense are freaked out about the home labs that people can get where they can purposely or accidentally create a pandemic or destroy ecosystems. So they, the, the, the lawmakers that are aligned with them, can protect the microbiome from there. The human health, there's now 50,000 studies showing the benefits of microbiome or the damage to human health. So now we have the lawmakers involved with human health can support this through that. Ocean protection, environmental protection, invasive species, all of that relates to the microbiome and whether we genetically engineer it. So even if we don't change in the long term or short term, the education system, we are taking the microbiome issue and installing it and highlighting it into other movements, through other experts, through the related lawmakers, through white papers and articles and films, so that it becomes a plank in others' platforms. So those that are talking about climate change and regenerative agriculture will have the two minutes devoted mm. to, and of course, we need to protect the microbiome. So that's our plan, <laughs> That's even that's if really we don't change the education system. That's wonderfully ironic because what you're talking about is uh, mimetic engineering. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So fight fire with fire. Yeah. So the idea here is that one of the great benefits of the work we're doing is that it's easy to convey the dangers. In the 16 minutes that someone watches the film, Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle, they get it. Virtually everyone gets it if they hang with that and consider the possibilities. It's logic. It's arithmetic. You change a microbe, it has a percent, you know, every time you genetically engineer a microbe, there's a percentage probability that it'll cause havoc or problems. Multiply that by a million. It increases the likelihood dramatically. And then across all these different microbes, you take that, and to multiply it by the, all the different species it can swap genes with, all the ways that those can mutate, all the 10,000 ecosystems it can enter. It's mathematics. Are we willing to take that risk now that we know that the microbiome is life critical in ecosystems and in human health? It's easy to convey. So our job is to take that message and put it into different packages of knowledge and then find a way to take the energy of those that have seen it and are convinced and turn it into policy change, which is why we have right now the advocacy platform where we've actually seen tens of thousands of messages going to elected officials and also to local and regional media. And we have on the database all the elected officials and regional media in the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. and the EU and Australia because this is not something that can be handled by one country. Mm. Gotcha. So let's let's end with some takeaways for my listeners. Uh, so Beautiful. No, 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 number one, don't no, don't buy or eat or share the Impossible Burger. Um, yes. Number number. Second, what's, what's, I would what's say number two. <laughs> number two, and this is for the benefit of the individuals, is eating organic. Organic does not allow GMOs, and it doesn't allow Roundup. If you can't eat organic, go to Responsible Technology dot org and get the report we've compiled all of the roundup residues studies on all these different foods so if you can't eat organic you can't eat organic you'll know not to eat oatmeal because oats are like a sponge to roundup which is sprayed just before harvest to dry down and desiccate the crop same with wheat same with lentils and mung beans and chickpeas. I'm sure some of your listeners love hummus. After visiting our report, you will not want to eat non-organic hummus because the chickpeas are soaked in Roundup, very high levels. And Roundup can damage fundamental aspects of health, the microbiome, leaky gut, neurotransmitters, hormones, mitochondria, digestion, etc. So eating organic and, again, go to the report to download or to access which foods you can eat to avoid Roundup residues or high levels of Roundup residues when you can't eat organic. And you'll also okay. have and that's a, a list of responsible, responsible technology.org. 
That's right. There's also the list of the okay. GMOs in our shopping guide there, and the, and how they're in in different ingredients and formats in the in the in the uh, processed foods. So that's two. Avoid the Impossible Burger, and then eat organic. Three, go to protectnaturenow.com, and there's three things from that site. First, watch the 16-minute film. Two, every month or so, we load our advocacy platform with a different campaign, and you, and you click there, you enter your address, all of your local officials appear with a pre-scripted message that you can customize. Single click goes to them. Single click goes to your, uh, sends a press announcement to your media. And then the next month we'll let you know if there's another campaign loaded. So that's something that you can do that has a lot more influence because it's your in your own jurisdiction. And then three, please go to the donate tab and find a number that works for you that you can make a monthly donation with. Because if it's a monthly donation, that means we can rely on it and hire people and create new assets, knowing that that's going to come month after month because our job is big, it's huge, it's expensive, and we're nowhere near where we need to be. We need to open up offices mm -hmm. in every continent. We need to work with the, you know, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, many countries and we're we're we know what we need to do. We need fuel to do it, and we we hope that you can participate if you're able to mm. on the donation side as well. Right. So you're not funded by Monsanto, huh? Funnily enough, I'm not even on their Christmas list. <laughs> I did, however, I do appear in some of their literature, their secret um, emails. Uh, I was featured in a roundup trial <clears throat> in the evidence where. The, they had hired a scientist to try and debunk me, so he creates all these lies online. And he sent a note to his handlers in Monsanto and the about me, and the subject line was whack-a-mole, because he was going to, you know how whack-a-mole, yeah, the thing yeah. steps up and you hit it down. And the response by the executive in Monsanto says, funny you should say that. Donna Farmer and I have been using that expression for two years, because they have a, a budget to go after anyone that points out problems of their technology. Turns out Donna Farmer is a toxicologist that studies glyphosate, and she and I later debated on the doctor's TV show nationally, and she claimed that the Roundup was safe, and I told her why it wasn't. And then when the Roundup trial came out and millions of documents were made public, I Googled her name within that file and pointed out to the pro producers of, of the doctors how in private she wasn't so confident. In private, she saw the links to death, of animals and, and cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So they did another show inviting her and me to come back. She didn't show up. And it was an hour long show blasting Monsanto science on national television. So I ended up with the mm -hmm. final word on that one anyway. Great. Right. Well, you know, I was when I was doing research on you. I was looking for dirt that they were putting out. And the uh, the, the three worst things I found was that you uh, used to teach dance. You do you do yoga and you meditate. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if that's if I that's know. the worst they found, you're either you're either really good at hiding your worst vices, or or it's not so much of a problem. Yeah, I admit that. I even admit to Monsanto that I'm a dancer because in my first book, Seeds of Deception, I describe being at a Lindy Hop workshop and during the break at a Thai restaurant, we invited some other dancers over, and the person sitting right across from me who was a dancer was the person that had safety studies on Monsanto's GMO crops. <laughs> and uh, we had a good discussion, which I described in the book. It was fascinating. Wow. Um, anything you want to say to folks that I haven't asked about or uh, elicited yet? Yes, I do. So there's a, a process. We covered a lot, Howie. I spoke very quickly. I wanted to get a lot in. And I apologize for those that process more slowly. But <clears throat> processing and knowing what I said and what we talked about is one thing. But what do you do with it? And the information, there's so much information out there that elicits fear or sadness or anger. People will tend to block it off. 
and not pay attention because of the un discomfort. So my suggestion or invitation is to digest the information in such a way that it creates empowerment. So instead of feeling like a victim, we can feel like a victor, where we get to choose what we call food and don't have to accept the food-shaped objects thrust upon us by the biotech industry and their enforcement wing in Washington. We get to choose how we want to bestow nature onto next generation rather than having it replaced in this generation so that we get cursed by the future generations for our folly. It is an invitation. It's an interesting invitation. Right now in this Protect Nature Now campaign, we have greater receptivity to our message than any time in history because of the pandemic, because the microbe issue is on everyone's mind. The fact that it travels, the fact that it mutates, the fact that it wreaks havoc, there is an unmet need to do something to try and stop future problems. And this is an example of, an un of a way to meet an unmet need. So we have more receptivity just at the time that the technology has developed that you can buy a do-it-yourself kit for gene editing on Amazon for $169. We have, we're at the cliff and the, the fix turns out to be marvelous. The fix turns out to be installing in humanity a new relationship with nature. Now that we have the ability to destroy and replace it, we have the capacity and requirement for our own survival to steward it, to honor it, to keep it precious and protected. Hence the name Protect Nature Now. So here I'm what I'm doing now is I'm massaging that same information that we've heard for the last hour. And I'm shifting it energetically, I think, to a way that this turns out to be a silver lining. So it, it gives empowerment instead of, oh my God, what am I going to do? It's this is an invitation to step up and be a leader in humanity and not a group of leaders where we say, this is something we need to pay attention to. We need to be the micro whisperers. We need to protect the nature of nature. And let's do it on social media. Let's do it in our conversations, in our writings, in our discussions, in a way that we actually model what we're looking for in other humans. Model that stewardship. Model that taking responsibility. And that way, in the same way that individuals who face crisis moments because of health issues, humanity is facing a crisis moment. Let's see the catalytic change, the cathartic change, so we step up as a new humanity. Because that's the requirement here. The data we have, we need the, the new digestion of this data to empower humanity to step into a new expression. Mm. So that's what I wanted to say. At the end. Oh, I, lo I love that because that puts a, a whole different positive empowered twist on the, on the current crisis, right? There, there is an opportunity. Not only is there an opportunity here, there is a, a calling. Right? Yeah. Like this, this is the, this is the very exciting last five minutes of that movie. And we get to, we get to write it. <laughs> All right. Sounds great. Don't tell me what happened in the movie, but I'll. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, Jeffrey Smith, thank you so much for the work you've been doing on behalf of all of us. And thank you so much for taking the time today. Howie, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you some other time when if you get feedback from this and people have stepped up and taken responsibility and made changes, I'd love to hear. Will do. It's a deal.